Well, who's ready for the ultimate comeback in your life? You know, I really believe that God is leading us step by step through some of the most difficult times, obviously, that many people have ever faced. 2021, as we're now well into it, is going to be a turnaround year for you. It's going to be a year of restoration. But right now, many people are still experiencing darkness and uh, difficult times in their life. And we need to know how to operate and navigate in dark times. Sometimes the world just gets darker and darker. But the Bible says the path of the righteous, that's our world, that's our world in God's kingdom, that's our world in Christ. Proverbs 418 says the path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. The path of the righteous. Think about that. It gets brighter and brighter. It doesn't get darker and darker for us in this world. There's going to be darkness in our lives. Sometimes there's going to be darkness, but we got to trust that that light that God is going to light our way with that light that shines brighter and brighter until the full day, that that's what gives us hope. That's what gives us confidence. That was that's what gives us trust and joy and peace. Like we can live in this peace and joy of the better future, this peace and joy of a better day, a better week, a better month, a better year. Boy, this has really been a theme in my life. Proverbs 418 lately, the path of the righteous. And remember, we're not righteous because we do everything right. We're the we're righteous because we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. He became sin so that we would become the righteousness of God through the abundance of grace, through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. We reign in life. Boy, we're not supposed to have life reign over us. We're supposed to reign over life. Reign as kings. One translation says, you know that he loved us in Revelation 1 5. He loved us. He washed us and he made us kings and priests in him. He loved us first. Don't ever forget that. He loved us first. He doesn't love what is washed. He washes what he loves. He loves us. And that's why he washed us in his own blood from all of our sins and then made us in verse six says he made us kings and priests in him. We are kings and priests. Hallelujah. And I want you to start ruling and reigning and walking in that authority that God gave you to walk in. And we're going to walk in that authority in the darkest of times as well, because remember last year, I really focused on perspective. And well, towards the end of the year, we really started focusing on perspective. And I want to carry that through this entire month and this entire season of our lives that we would. It's not what we're looking at. It's how we're looking at it. Right that we're always looking for the good. We're always expecting the good. We're always believing for the good. We're always remembering the good and we're always doing the good. Or obviously we don't we're not always doing that, but we need to shift our perspective to look for the good in everything that God promises us that he doesn't cause all things, but he causes all things to work together for good. Right. Romans 8, 28. For those that love him and are called according to his purpose, that's you and that's me. So no matter how dark it is today, no matter how dark your financial situation might be, no matter how dark your emotional situation might be, family situation, health situation, we're not going to be afraid of the dark. The Bible says, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. So we're going to learn how to not be afraid of the dark today. Dark times happen to every one of us. I think we all know what it's like to be searching for a light switch in a dark room. We've all been there. That feeling of uncertainty or you might stumble over something. We all face dark times in life. Sometimes they're moments, sometimes they're months. Sometimes there are seasons where it seems as if darkness is hovering over our soul. And when I speak of darkness, I'm talking about times of uncertainty, times of discouragement, times when it seems like hope is dim, that God is far. But as God said, it's always darkest before the dawn. If you're facing a dark moment or a season in your life, don't be afraid. 
the light is coming. Remember, one of the reasons we can always be full of faith, full of optimism, full of confidence. Those are God words. Those are our words. Optimism isn't for people that are just in a self-help uh, mentality. Optimism is for us to expect the good, expect the best, to look for the brighter days, to expect the brighter days. These are your days. No matter how dark it is, we're turning that around. We have authority to do something about it. And that's what I want to talk about today. So when we speak of darkness, limitations, feel limited by your financial situation, limited in your physical situation, where you feel like things are out of control or you feel helpless. Darkness also speaks of times that when the things that we trusted can't be relied on anymore, where people we looked to seem distant or unsympathetic in our situation, the things we looked for to, for to comfort and, and warm us offer no peace anymore. That's dark times. I'm sorry to make it. I don't mean to make uh, create a dark moment here, but I want you to understand God knows what we're going through. And that's why it says that um, we don't have to fear any evil, no matter what it looks like, no matter how bad the situation gets. And that's why I've been talking to you about breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthroughs and revival are always on the other side of darkness. I've been saying that for weeks and I want to keep saying it to you. Breakthroughs. Who needs a breakthrough? Raise your hand right where you're watching, right where you're sitting, right where you are. You need a breakthrough. Came to the right place. Breakthroughs and revival are always on the other side of darkness. Darkness isn't new to God. Darkness is not new to you or me. Remember uh, John 11 4, one of our key scriptures in the NIV Bible, John 11, verse four. Look at what he says. I'm so thankful for this verse. It's been speaking to me for weeks and weeks. And I love it that Jesus said when he had heard about Lazarus's death, he said this sickness. Come on now, this is never this should never get old for you because it's never getting old for me. When he heard about Lazarus's death, he said this sickness will not end in death. Well, when he heard he was sick, he said this sickness will not end in death. And yet it did. It. It resulted in death, but it didn't end there. Jesus said something very powerful that we don't sometimes we overlook. This sickness will not end in death. Now, there are many translations to this, but this is the one that really speaks to me the most. This sickness will not end in death. And yet Lazarus did die. That's why we have to put our trust and confidence in what God said, no matter how it looks or no matter how worse it might get in some situations. Remember, Jairus uh, came to Jesus and said, my daughter is sick. Come and lay hands on her. And then as Jesus went, she died. In other words, even while Jesus was on the way, the situation got worse before it got better. So don't let when a situation gets worse for you, don't let that fool you or trick you into thinking that God's not working on it because God said this sickness. Jesus said this sickness will not end in death. And yet it included death, but it didn't end in death because death is death is not final with God. Death is final in the flesh, but death is not final with God. Nothing is no matter how bad it is. Why? Because he's the God who raises the dead, right? We were forced to trust God. Not a bad idea since he's the God that raises the dead. So let's talk about this and um, and really put this in proper perspective. And remember that your breakthrough is on the other side of this darkness. If we just walk by faith and not by sight, trust in his goodness and trust in his grace. What is it in your life right now where there's darkness? You might be in a dark place emotionally, a dark place financially, a dark place in your family. I want you to remember something really simple here. Psalm 139, verse 12 says dark, even darkness is not dark to God. Even darkness is not dark. He said. Because to him, darkness is the same as light because he is all light. See, darkness is just like a temporary 
appearance. When God is light, possesses light, brings light, and we have the power to bring light. Whew. OK, here we go. What do we do in the dark times? Genesis 1, 2 says the darkness covered the deep waters, as you heard me share before. Darkness over the surface of the deep. And yet God thrives in the darkest times. God said, let there be light. Boy, the Holy Spirit is moving in your situation right now. I think you need to hear this. Somebody needs to hear this. The Holy Spirit is moving in your situation right now. You might not feel him. It might not look like he is. In this case, in verse two, it says there was darkness covering the whole earth, but the spirit of God was moving. The spirit of God was moving. And I want you to I want you to see this. I want you to know this is happening right now. Wherever there's darkness, the spirit of God is always moving. And what changes the darkness into light is words. And we'll get to that. But then God said, let there be light. And there was light. But I want you to know right now the Holy Spirit is moving in your family. The Holy Spirit is moving in your financial situation. The Holy Spirit is moving wherever there's darkness. Is there darkness in your health? The Spirit of God is moving in your health situation. He's moving in your body. Is there darkness in your family? He's moving in your family. Is there darkness in your finances? He's moving in your finances. Yes, he always moves over any situation where there's darkness. He is moving right now. The spirit of God lives inside of you, but the spirit of God is omnipotent. He can be everywhere all the time. He's not just living inside of you. He's all around your situation right now as well. Oh, that's good news. And somebody needs to hear that. Get take that joy knowing that the spirit of God is moving over your situation right now. I just declare healing where there's sickness and darkness of pain and darkness of pain and sickness, disease. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're moving in that body over that body. And I release healing right now in Jesus name. Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're moving over the waters of each person's finance, where there's darkness in their finances. I release and I activate blessing and speak blessing right now in Jesus name. Father, where there's depression and anxiety and fear. I speak peace and joy and an awareness of your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, moving in each person's life who's feeling that right now. I speak light. I speak peace. I speak joy. I speak confidence. I speak calm to the raging waters of your life right now in Jesus name. Whew. Man, Jesus did that. That's why I do that. That's why you do that. That's why we can do that, because Jesus did that. I'm just doing and speaking over your life the way Jesus has shown me and oh, oh, how he spoke over situations. You have that same power. I don't have that power because I'm a pastor. I got that power because I'm a son of God and you're a son or daughter of God as well. All right. OK, now let me let me finish this and start it and finish it and all at the same time, basically. <laughs> so what do we do in our midnight hour when there's darkness? What do we do? Number one, we have to have an anchor for our soul. You have to have an anchor for your soul. Our soul needs an anchor. I think it's in Hebrews chapter six, where it says hope is the anchor of our soul. We have to have hope in the promises of God. We have to have an anchor. Everybody needs an anchor. Every ship needs an anchor. What does an anchor do? It's some people consider their job an anchor, uh, their spouse an anchor or close friends an anchor in their life. But God wants his word and his promises to be your anchor. When storms of darkness hit, you need to be anchored in faith in the promises of God. It says this hope we have is an anchor of the soul. That Jesus went before us as a high priest and passed through what divided us from God. And he is now brought us near. We have this hope as our anchor, a hope both sure and steadfast. I want you to know that you you have an anchor. 
when the winds are trying to move you, the enemy's trying to move you in all sorts of different directions. You got to have an anchor. And when it's dark, you got to have an anchor. What is the anchor? God's promises are his anchor, are our anchor. Romans 8:31. If God be for me, who can be against me? If God be for you, who can be against you? You see, it really isn't a question. He does say, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question. The first question is a legitimate question of a question needs an answer. But what shall we say to these things is the question. The answer is, if God is for us, who is who can be against us? That's the answer. It is leaves a question mark there. But only because it's rhetorical. If God is for us, doesn't matter who's against us. God is for you. It doesn't matter what's against you. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter uh, what's happening in politics, what's happening in government. We, we operate by the government of God. We're governed by something higher than this world's systems, We're governed by love, spirit of God, the word of God. That's our anchor. Love is our anchor. God's word is our anchor. An anchor is a base, right? It's something that always brings you back to the same place, the same truth. It's a constant. It's a North Star. If God be for me, who could be against me? God is on my side. These are this is my anchor that that I'm more than a conqueror. This whole passage of Romans chapter eight is my anchor. I want you to take this as your anchor that you are. We are now more than conquerors because he loves us. We're more than conquerors. That's the anchor. We're more than conquerors. And if God be for us, who can be against us? He didn't spare his own son. Therefore, he's not going to hold anything. He's going to freely give us all things he will not withhold from you. Wow, that's an anchor for me. It needs to be an anchor for you, knowing that because he loves us, even when we don't see the answer yet, we don't feel it. We know that it's turning around for our good. It's turning around for your good right now. Listen, the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 130, verse 130, Psalm 119, I believe, verse 130, the entrance of his word brings light. The entrance of his word. The entrance, I think the King James says the entrance of his word. I think the New American Standard says the unfolding of his word. Think about it. It's unfolding in front of you. It's entering the entrance of his word gives light. So number one, we have to have an anchor. Our anchor is his, our anchor is hope in the goodness of God. Right. Our anchor is God is for me, not against me. Our anchor is Psalm 27, verse 13. I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living boy. When that never gets old for me. How about you? I would have despaired. What 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 anchor gives me hope? What is the anchor that gives me hope that no matter what it looks like right now? I would have despaired unless I believed unless I believe what I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. There's our anchor. Secondly, enter his word. The second thing that that brings light, that brings a breakthrough out of darkness, while we don't have to fear the dark is the entrance of his word. Boy, when the word of God enters a situation, what situation are you dealing with? A bad report from the doctor, a bad report in your finances, whatever it is, enter the word, enter the word, enter the word, enter the word. In other words, the entrance of his word brings light. So make sure that the word makes an entrance into that situation. When you, when I walk into hospitals, I make sure the I make sure the word enters the hospital room with me. If I'm going to pray for the sick or whatever the situation is, whatever you're going through, whatever is dark, make sure the word enters. See to it that the word of God enters into that situation, that the word of God enters your home, the word of God enters your family, the word of God enters your day. Every day we should pierce the darkness with the word of God because the word brings light and light brings healing and light brings sight and light brings answers and light brings warmth. And light is most powerful force besides the love of God is the light. 
without the light, we're in the dark, we're going to be cold, we're going to die. <laughs> light brings, it causes seeds to grow. So make sure you have the power to see the word enter your situation because the entrance of his word gives light. It gives light. It gives light. It gives light, which brings us to the next thing that we do in the darkness. How how can we no matter what, what pandemic, finances, economics, family situations, disease, hopelessness, what what do we do about it? Well, here's what we do when it's dark. We don't talk about the darkness. We talk to the darkness. When G when God said darkness was over the earth, but the Holy Spirit was over the Hey, there's darkness over your situation. And the Holy Spirit's over your situation. You decide which one is going to prevail. When God said, let there be light, that's when the Holy Spirit, who was moving over the face of the deep, brought light into the darkness. You are the deciding factor. Which one are you going to let both darkness and the Holy Spirit are moving in your situation? It seems like darkness is winning. But when you open your mouth, the entrance of his word brings light. And when you talk to the situation rather than about the situation, it changes. It has to obey you. Jesus said it did. Mark 11, 23, he said, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt, but believes that what he says shall happen, it shall be granted to them. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 24, when you pray, believe, believe that you have received all things for which you pray and ask. I think we miss this sometimes. All things for which you pray and ask, believe you have received them. Well, I, I'm not going to believe I receive them until I see him. He, that's not how that's not how light works. That's not how God's word works. All things for which you pray and ask, believe you received them. Why should we believe we received them? Because Jesus already paid for them. So we should believe we've received them because when you're asking for it is not when it happens. When Jesus died on the cross is when it happened. But when you pray and ask for it, that's when you activate it. That's when you're bringing and you're inviting what Jesus did for you into your situation. Believe you have received them, though, whatever those things are, all things that you pray and ask for. Believe you have received them and they're granted to you. That's the grace of God. That's so beautiful. I believe I've received it. Yeah. That's when they're going to be granted. That's when they're going to be. Begin to manifest in your life. Believe you've received them. Don't wait till you start feeling better. Believe you receive it even when you're not feeling better and trust. And we'll get to that. Too many times, though, we go on and on about our situation, don't we? We talk about it rather than to it. We keep circling around the same old problems, cir circling around the same struggle, same issues. Or maybe those things get even worse because talking about them doesn't change them for the better. But talking to them does talking to anxiety. Talk back to the stuff that's talking to you. Talk back. Be a, boy, there's a reason why we all grew up kind of rebelling against our parents at one point or another. We all rebelled in one way or another. We learned how to talk back to our parents. I'm not saying that that's right. But what I'm saying is if we could do it with the people that love us, we could talk back to the people that love us. Maybe we start talking back to the things that hate us. Talk back to that sickness. Talk back to that anxiety. Talk back to that financial problem. Talk back to that debt. It's been talking to you long enough. That loneliness has been talking to you long enough. That fear has been talking to you long enough. Talk back to that stuff. Talk back to that thing that's saying to you, you're not going to make it or you're a loser. You're a failure. Hey, talk back to that stuff. We got to learn to talk back. Talk back to the things we you talk back to your parents. Talk back to your teachers. Talk back to the pastor. <laughs> Talk back to your situation and it will obey you. Yeah. Oh, sometimes we focus so much on how we're supposed to obey. We forget how things are supposed to obey us. Got to really get a hold of that. 
light will flood your life. So I tell you, death and life, right, are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21 says we could have we could, our tongue can bring bring death to Jesus brought death to that fig tree. So what's something in your life that needs to die? Fear, anxiety, debt, speak to it to die and speak life to abundance, speak life to your body, speak life over your family, speak life over your situation. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Whatever you attach it to will produce fruit. The word those who love it, it means whatever you attach your tongue to. Love is the word attachment here. Whatever you attach your tongue to, you're going to eat the fruit of it. If you attach your tongue to to negativity, you're going to eat negativity. If you attach your tongue to positive things, speak the word of God, the promises of God, the goodness of God, the love, speak those things. You're going to eat that fruit. See, in God's grace, he's given us so much power and authority. Yet I think sometimes we're waiting for God to do it when he already did it. It's in the heavenlies and now we speak it and it manifests from the heavenlies into the earthlies. <laughs> this is a beautiful gift that God's given us. Let's use it. Let's use it as is thanks in, in dark times. We should thank God, too. I'm I want to wrap this up in a few moments, but we should um, we should really remember in dark times that God's with us and begin to praise him and thank him anyway. He's not out there. Praise doesn't bring God into the situation. Praise simply helps you magnify the fact that God's with you anyway, even if you don't feel him. That's why praise is so powerful and thanks is so powerful. We're not thanking God to get him to do something. We're thanking him even though we don't see what he's doing. We're thanking him even if we don't feel what he's doing. We're thanking him even though it might not look like it's turning around. We're thanking him because it's already done. It was finished at the cross. Let's fall at his feet and worship him because he did it all. He did it all. Jesus did it all. That's why thanks and praise in dark times is so beautiful and so powerful. Paul and Silas began to praise God and in jail. They weren't trying to praise God to get out of jail. They were praising God because they loved him. So in fact, the prison doors, we talked about this recently, the prison doors open, the, the chains came off of their feet and off of their hands. But they just stayed there and kept singing, and kept praising and kept praying. And then the jailer was about to kill himself. And they said, no, don't, don't do that. Come on, join the family. And the jailer got saved and all his family members got saved. You and your whole household shall be saved. It says in Acts 16. Wow. Sometimes we we need to just. Remember the simple, the simple concept of thanking God and praising God, trusting God, which is the next thing I want to come to. But. You know, there's a, a story that I've told. I'll remind you about a little boy. Remember, he was afraid of the dark. And his mother asked him to go to the back porch and bring in the broom so she could sweep the kitchen. The little boy, when the mother asked him to do that, said, Mommy, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. His mother smiled and reassuringly at her son and said, oh, it's OK, darling. You don't have to be afraid of the dark, she explained. Jesus is out there. Jesus is out there, she said. He'll look after you. He'll protect you. Little boy looked at his mother real hard and asked, are you sure he's out there? She said, yes, I am sure he is everywhere and he is always ready to help you when you need him. She promised him. So he thought about it for a minute and then he went to the back door and he cracked it open just a little. Kept his body inside the house, but cracked the back door a little open and he yelled out and he said, Jesus, if you're really out there, can you hand me the broom? <laughs> How many are in a situation like that right now? You need Jesus to hand, hand you the broom. Well, you know what? He'll do that if you need him to do that. But trust in the darkness. Trust in the darkness. 
You know, there are a lot of definitions for trust. A lot of ways to explain it, but I I like this way. There was a television program years ago. It was during the 1988 Winter Olympics and the program right before the Olympics was a show that featured blind skiers. People that literally were skiing blindly on the slopes, being trained for slalom uh, skiing, which seems impossible to be blind and be able to ski and navigate down a hill with all manner of things that they could run into or cause them to fall and injure themselves. So what? But how did how did they do it? Each blind skier was paired with a sighted skier. And the sighted skier teaches the blind skier as they're skiing how to make right and left turns. When they mastered that, when that was mastered, they were taken to the slope where their sighted partner, the blind skiers had their sighted partners ski beside them, shouting left, right. First, they taught them how to respond left, right in the dark, in the obviously dark, blind. And as they obeyed the command of the one that was skiing next to them, they were able to negotiate down the slope and cross the finish line, depending only on the sighted skiers word left, right, right, left. It was either complete trust or catastrophe. What a picture of how we should trust God. Left, right, man, we don't see it, but he says, trust me today. Speak my word. I don't want I don't feel it. Speak it anyway. Forgive that person. I don't want to forgive them anyway. Give that thing away. No, I, can't. I don't know, Lord. Do it anyway. It's going to be catastrophe if we don't. It's going to be total. Peace. When we trust God. Not leaning on our own understanding. Remember, we've been saying for months and years. We take care of the trusting. God takes care of the timing. He will direct your path. He will make your path straight. Wow. We we don't even have the power to make it straight. Except by trusting him and he will make it. Is something crooked? Is something going in the wrong direction for you? Trust. And he will make it straight. Trust, take him at his word. When he says, go this way, son, go this way, darling, go this way, daughter, go this way. He knows better than us. Obedience to God is. The reason it's so good is not because he doesn't love us if we disobey or we're cursed if we disobey. It's just smarter to obey God because he's smarter. It's just smarter to hear his word and be a doer of it is what the Bible describes as wisdom to hear his word and act, act upon it. Whew. In fact, right now. And I want to do something special as soon as we pray for souls to be saved, because Lord put on my heart when the pandemic started. Don't ever have a service ever again where you don't invite people. To be saved, so if you've never received Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord. I want to pray with you. Would you just pray this out loud after me? And then I have one final point for everybody to let the light in. But pray this if you'd like to be saved and be sure you're going to heaven. Heavenly Father, just say that Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my savior and Lord. 
Say that out loud. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. From this moment forward, I am forgiven. The blood of Jesus cleanses me of all my sin. And I say this and I am a child of God. Say that I am a child of God. Yes, that's you. You're born again. You're in the family of God. Congratulations. All of heaven rejoices over one soul, your soul being saved. Wow. I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you. Would you let me know if you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Let me know there's a link on your screen or in the comment box. Go to that link and download my free book, The Power of a New Life. It's a simple Bible study, question and answer Bible study with the answers there. It's an open book test. It'll bless you. It'll take you through the next steps of this adventure with God. And as we close today, congratulations again. Please download that book and let me know that you accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You know, one of the things as we close, I want to do something special for the hurting and the suffering because so many people are worse off than I am. So many people are worse off than you are. I know sometimes you're watching right now and you might be like, I'm pretty bad off. I want to help you if you are any way I can. But there's always somebody that's not doing as well as we are. There's always somebody that's suffering more than us and is having a harder time more than more than me or more than you. And I want to help those people as well, because Isaiah gives us the secret to light breaking forth. We're talking about dealing with darkness in life. Here's one of the ways Isaiah 58, verse 10. And I want you to open your heart up to this. He says, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in the darkness and your gloom. Well, I don't know all that that word gloom means, but it sounds pretty gloomy, right? It's pretty dark and your gloom, your depression, your sadness will become like the brightness, the midday noon, the brightest time of the day. And your gloom will become like the midday. But notice what he says at the beginning of verse 10, as you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted boy in 2020. We fed more people in 2020 than we had, I think, in the five years combined previous to that. And I want 2021 to be I want us to be even more generous. You know, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. Can we like, activate some light right now together? Let's just activate this light by he says, give yourself to the hungry, satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Could I ask you to make a special gift at this in this moment? I know that you, you put God first. Hopefully you gave him your tithe. But I want you to. Make a special gift and I want us to just dig a little deeper to help more people. I want this gospel to get out, but the gospel sometimes can't be heard if a person is so hungry that they can't eat. Let's get food, let's get supplies, let's keep our outreach to the hurting and to the suffering on the forefront of what we do. Let's keep this as a priority in our lives that remember, we've been given a gift, the gift to reprioritize our lives. And one of the greatest priorities we can have is helping the poor. It's blessing the poor. We're blessed to be a blessing. Hey, there's some ways you can give and We've talked about many times and you can look up on our website all the things that that you're giving is accomplishing all the people that we're feeding locally, globally. We're doing everything we can. We you know what? I don't think I don't even think that's true. I don't think we're doing everything we can. I think we can do better and I want to do better and I want us to do better together. So let's give. Would you make a gift of whatever your heart moves you to do, whatever the Holy Spirit speaks to you to do, whatever you're capable of doing step out in faith and let's give ourselves to the hungry like this verse says and satisfy the desire of the afflicted and let's help the poor. Let's help the hurting. There's several ways on your screen that you can give right now. Would you take a moment? It's a special gift for the poor, for the hungry, for the suffering that we get to bless in this world, in our neighborhoods and in the neighborhoods where this ministry penetrates. 
Father, thank you for each person giving. I bless them. Thank you, Lord, for blessing them to be a blessing. I speak increase over every person watching this right now. I speak increase over their finances. I speak increase over their seed. Thank you, Lord, that we plant, we water, but you give the increase. You're the God of increase. I prophesy increase over you today in Jesus name. And I thank you for your generosity. Thank you for staying connected. Thank you for being a part of this special church family. We get to call home life changers. I love you guys. Can't wait to see you at our next service. We'll see you then.